Hey folks, Tony Russo here, host of the Pines Cast. Before we get started, I just want to give you a quick update. This interview that you're about to hear was recorded before the Ocean Pines Association and the Ocean Pines Volunteer Fire Department signed their historic memorandum of understanding. The agreement includes provisions for fire protection and EMS services by the OPVFD for the OPA and construction of a new South Fire Station. For more information, visit oceanpines.org and click on news. Now, here's the show. Ocean Pines is a vibrant residential community nestled on Maryland's eastern shore. With over nine miles of waterfront property, amenities like an 18-hole championship golf course and a public yacht club, and a rich history dating back to 1968. Of course, if you live here, you probably know most of that. And if you don't, it's almost all apparent from your first visit. Each week on the Pines cast, we work to bring out the ocean pines that might be less apparent. We celebrate the region, the amenities, and, most of all, the people who make and keep ocean pines a special place to live. Welcome to the Pines cast, your source of news and insights about ocean pines and the official podcast of the Ocean Pines Association. This week, we're speaking with Joe Enstay. He is the president of the Ocean Pines Volunteer Fire Department, and we are so excited to talk to him about all the things that are going on at the fire department. We chat about him growing up in Ocean Pines and his decision to join the Volunteer Fire Department, but mostly we focus on how, if you're interested, you can get involved in the fire department, and also why people get involved interested and involved in the fire department. It's a great conversation. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Gentle reminder, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you just want to make sure I'm checking my email, you can reach me at bytonyrusso at gmail.com. That is B-Y-T-O-N-Y-R-U-S-S-O at gmail.com. And I will respond. If you have any comments about the show, I'd be happy to read them or if you want to send me a voice message, I'd be happy to play it if it is appropriate. All right, enough of me. Let's take a second and talk to Joe. So you grew up in Ocean Pines, and that's more of a thing now than it has been for a very long time. Can you tell me what it was like growing up in Ocean Pines? Sure. Uh, I mean, it was a really cool experience for me. Um, my family moved to the area. We we were originally from across the bridge up in Harford County. Um, we moved to the area and I guess I started in fifth grade down here and instantly made friends down here. And, you know, my best friends, you know, lived right in the area. Even one of them at one point in time lived like on a different street, but we went through the backyard and I was in his backyard. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just cool having kind of that community where we had moved from. It was a nice area, but you know, all the houses were really spread out. So every house had an acre of land. So it took quite a while to, to kind of get around the neighborhood. Whereas here, it was nice. I could just jump on my bike and go see a, a handful of friends, you know, in a half an hour versus a half an hour to get down the road to see one person. Right. Can you tell me about how long you 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 were there before before you ended up going to college and what were what were some of the things to do? when you were growing up? We, I think we officially moved into the Pines sometime around 2001, beginning in 2001. And I graduated Stephen Decatur High School in 2005, um, spent the summer coming back and forth between Baltimore. Finally, in 2010 is when I moved up to Delaware. Um, growing up down here, we'd always go to the parks. It wasn't often, but anytime we got snow, we always tried to find some level of hill. Sometimes it was even just the side of Route 90 uh, to yeah. slide down or, uh, you know, going through the uh, <laughs> the streets on the <laughs> on, on our sleds or tubes or things like that, going to the ponds and, and fishing and things like that. Honestly, uh, a lot of my free time uh, during that time was honestly being involved in the fire department. I got involved in the fire department uh, when I was 15 years old. And, you know, every waking moment I had basically was there because that's where my friends were. You know, we I, there was a bunch of us that joined at the same time. Uh, and so that's kind of like where our focus went to. And what was the cadet program like at the time? Um, when we initially joined, uh, there was only one other cadet. Her name was <laughs> Sarah. And then it was myself and uh, my best friend, Dale. We joined in February of 2003. And then after that, we had a couple more of our friends join up. It was great because we had some amazing leaders leadership in the fire department from the chief down to the career officers that were there. Skip Carey ran the cadet program at that time. Skip is actually a former board member here in Ocean mm. Pines. He worked for Ocean Pines Fire Department for or volunteer fire department for many, many years. Um, he's currently the second 
or first vice president of the Maryland State Firemen's Association. Uh, but he took all of our us cadets under his wings and really kind of taught us the ropes. And there are still things that I know that, you know, we just had a drill earlier this week that I was regurgitating some of the lessons that he taught me to them about, you know, the importance of safety and what to do when you're on a roof and, you know, you know, keeping yourself safe during an incident and things like that. Hmm. What was the attraction? How did you find out that there was such a thing as a cadet program? Like what what got you to the fireplace, to fireplace. <laughs> what what got you to to fire service in general? Like, did you just knock on the door and say, "Hey, did you have a cadet program?" Or was it something you read about? Were they doing a recruiting drive? So, I think as a kid, I was always infatuated with fire trucks. Anytime that I heard a siren, I needed to look and see what was going on and where it was going. And I guess when we first moved to Ocean Pines, uh, because a cadet program start when you are 14. So a cadet program, for those that don't know, is uh, kind of like a junior firefighter program. You kind of can get in there, be fire ground support, learn things about the fire department, learn about the trucks and the, and the dynamics of incidents, and really kind of be what we call fire ground support. Uh, mm-hmm. Until you reach 18 and, and get your certifications, then you can become a full-fledged firefighter. For me, I just decided that this is what I wanted to do. And I had originally uh, reached out and I wanted to join. I, I didn't know anything about Ocean Pines having a fire department or anything like that. But my sister's boyfriend was in the Ocean City Fire Department. He was a cadet over there. So I initially reached out to them, tried to apply to be a cadet over there. But because I didn't live in Ocean City, uh, mm. I wasn't allowed to be. Um, right. So a couple of years passed. And then again, my best friend Dale and I, we were hanging out with some Ocean City cadets. Ran on, they went on a fire call. We went with them. And I said to Dale, I was like, hey, we we should do this. And he was like, yeah, sure. Why not? So I just basically cold called Ocean Pines was like, hey, do you guys have anything like this? And they're like, "Uh, yeah, fill out an application. And next thing you know, (laughs) we're doing it. And what surprised you as a kid? Like, what did you think it was going to be versus what it was? I think for me, I never initially understood just the impact that one has when they're involved in the fire service or any type of public service. I knew I wanted to help people. I knew I wanted to be a part of it, but I didn't realize that initially that, you know, we're going to be encountering people during the sometimes the worst moments of their lives. And they are looking to you to help them and calm them down and be a resource for them during these quite traumatic events. And for me, it was a real big learning experience to see how all the, you know, the the more experienced members of the fire department handled those situations. And it's, it's lessons that I could take away and put in my toolbox about mm. how to handle myself when I got into those situations later on in my career. And as a, as a high school student, were you so I was 18 when I was a senior because I started when I was a little bit older. Were you able to to get your firefighter certification while you were still in high school or did you have to wait until after you graduated? Yes, I uh, I got it before I graduated. Actually, oh. um, I have got my fire one certification and my fire two certification the summer before I went to college. So I, I think I was 16 when I was certified as a firefighter one. Um, but because of insurance requirements and things like that, I wasn't technically allowed to uh. go into the building and fight fires, but I at least had the, the skills and experience. And when we were doing trainings and things like that, I could continue to get experience. And also I had a different perspective than being through that fire cl- class. I knew more so of, okay, what was going to happen on an incident? And I could kind of help be more prepared to help the rest of the team members that were getting ready to go inside or interior of a fire or something like that. You know, outside of fires where you rerun car accidents and things like that, you know, you, you know I was definitely more able to help with those things too. Um, just not the actual packing up and going into the fire, you know, until you turn 18. And um, you, so you mentioned that you you went away to college. Um, can I-, I did my internship with the Worcester County Fire Marshal's office. And then when I was in grad school, I did an assistant with the emergency manager for the University of Delaware. And so I always had that emergency public service side of things. Um, After I graduated from Delaware, it was a tough time to work in higher ed. So I ended up working in a a nonprofit consulting firm for a while. So I was working with clients like Boys and Girls Club of America, um, police athletic leagues, 4-H, things like that. Uh, And then I went and worked in education technology for about two years. Uh Uh-huh. Finally, I got the opportunity to go and work in higher ed, and I did that for about four years. Um, I ended my career in higher ed as the director of uh, basically student activities and leadership uh, for university. And then I kind of went back to um, education technology for a while until I made a major career switch and became a fire marshal and a fire investigator for the town of Ocean City. That's plenty of experience that you kind of bring to the table. There's the life-saving element and there's the training element, but you also have to find a way to keep the lights on. And so how do you guys balance that out, like the training time plus, you know, making sure that, you know, when the electric bill comes, there's 
money in the checking account for it. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, it's one of those things that every every volunteer uh, needs to find the balance. Uh, every volunteer needs to find what's going to work for them, and it really starts a lot with their families. Our families are just as much involved uh, in our service as anyone else because they're the ones that are also making the sacrifice for us having to get up and leave the dinner table and things like that. Um, so I think for for us and for you know at least my family. Uh, it's really about, you know, just having conversations about, you know, when when we need to prioritize going to the firehouse, whether it be for drills and you know meetings and things like that. When is it time to prioritize family time? Uh, and then the, the the situations of, OK, when is it OK to leave a, a particular family function? When is it not OK to leave a family function? And I think a lot of it also depends on the severity of the call. You know, I'm I'm one of those people that it doesn't matter what the call is, if 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 I'm available, I'm going to be there and I'm going to go. Mm. Um, and thankfully, I have I've been able to position myself into a career that gives me a lot of flexibility. I left the fire marshal's office last October and actually worked for a basically a public safety technology company. Mm. Um, so we uh, I work from home again. And so that gives me the, a lot of flexibility to help the community and run calls during the day. You know, at the end of the day, we always say that, you know, your, your family comes first um, and your and your career has to come first. You know, there are some people that have a, a full time career in public safety, rather be as a police officer or a firefighter or paramedic somewhere. Other people, we, we have people that are, you know, director of operations for Dunkin' Donuts. We have people that are teachers. Everybody in the volunteer fire service comes from different walks of life. Uh, and uh-huh. so, you know, we just kind of continue to have open dialogue with each other and with our families and say, hey, where do we need to prioritize? Because at the end of the day, we 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 call the the fire service a, a brotherhood or a family, and it really is. You know, we're always constantly checking in on each other, seeing how each other's families are doing. You know, and say, "Hey, you okay? You don't look so hot. What's going on?" And right. you know, and so I think there's a, a level of accountability that we all have for each other to make sure that you know no one's spending too much time at the firehouse and not being able to you know pay that mortgage payment or, or whatever <laughs> it might be when it when it comes through. And kind of along those lines, so what is your I guess, volunteer pitch, like how, as far as recruiting goes, is how much of it is we we need your time, but not all of it. Like, because I guess the more volunteers you have, the fewer volunteers you need, but also all the all the holes, the more you have, the fewer holes there are when it's unlikely that there'll be any ever be a day when no one. Yeah. So I I would say kind of pulling the back of the curtain a little bit, volunteering has changed a lot over I mean, even from the time that I started joining or I started the, in the fire service in 2003 till today, the time commitments that folks have are much different. And so the volunteer fire service as a whole is continuing to evolve. And, you know, there was a time that we needed less people to accomplish a lot. And now we need more people because what we're trying to do is kind of break up those responsibilities and roles into into smaller chunks. So that way people can volunteer, but it can fit into the schedules that they have. I know I know myself, you know, I coach baseball for my son. Uh, my son also is into racing. I have a, a family business with with my parents. I have my own full time career. You know, I'm active in the fire department. There's a million and one things going on in my life, but I can I can prioritize it all. You know, and, and I, I know what those things are because we're transparent about. Okay, hey, this is what we have going on, and what we try to do really well is is have an opportunity for anyone that wants to get involved to have a, a, a spot and a space in the fire department. Rather, it's to be a firefighter. Rather, it's to be an administrative member who just. Uh, who really kind of focuses in on our fundraising efforts, rather it be someone that is really involved from an EMT standpoint or someone that, you know, does it all or someone that, you know, maybe used to be a firefighter or used to be a police officer. And now they want to be in our, you know, fire police ranks to help us with crowd control and traffic management and, and supporting us on incident scenes. So we have a lot of different opportunities to get involved. uh, And we try to keep all those expectations realistic. You know, we, we run about 340, 350 fire calls a year. Our requirement is you need to make 50 of those. You know, we have a a monthly meeting every Tuesday requirement. You just need to make six of those 12 meetings. Same thing with drills. We usually have two drills a month. You just have to make about 50 percent of those. So we try to make it as um, accommodating as we can. But there's also reality that when you volunteer, you are volunteering to to donate your time and, and do the put in the work to make sure that at the end of the day, we are going to have people there to help our community. And, you, you know, and kind of going back to your original question, as far as like what my pitch is, it's to me, it's really if you have ever wanted to make a difference, do something for your community. This is the perfect opportunity. We have so many different opportunities to get involved that we, we can really accommodate most people. The the other side of it too is the thing that I always look at is 
if my family was ever in need, I'd want someone to come and help me. And that's what kind of drives me and motivates me. That's what gets me up in the middle of the night. That's what takes me away from, you know, Christmas morning, because I know that if my family needed something on that day, I know that I would have people that would be coming to help me. So I need to go help people in those moments, too. As far as people getting involved, do you do do you do drives for um, for volunteers? You know, because I feel like there's probably never enough because of what we were just mentioning. So we always want to bring in good people. So we're constantly recruiting. Um, we are accepting applications year round, uh, but we will go through different periods where we kind of really put a focus on trying to do recruitment drives, especially around, uh, usually we usually have a big open house. And so around that time, we are really driving, trying to get folks in the door. Um, but we also try to cycle it around when classes are being held. So that way, during the summertime, it's hard to come in because there's not a lot of classes that are happening right. during the summertime because of the heat. At the end of the day, if someone walks up to us tomorrow and says they want to be involved, we'll go through the process and bring them in. There is not really a, a time that we're going to say, no, we don't, we're, we, we don't want you in, in our department. You know, now you will have to follow, you know, the, the, the rules and regulations that we have and things like that. And you, you need to be involved for the right reasons. But at the end of the day, uh, if you want to be a part of our ranks, we, we want to find a space for you. And, and to be clear or, or to clarify, because I'm not a hundred percent sure that I got it. There are, I don't want to call them administrative, but there are non-school volunteer opportunities where I could come in and I could do stuff without having to get my fire certification. Yeah. So the administrative volunteers, uh, they are our primary source for kind of driving our fundraising efforts. Everyone in our department has a fundraising requirement because it is so important to the the strength of the fire department to make sure that we can have the, the funds we need to purchase new fire trucks and support the overall uh, operations of the department. But our, our administrative team is really the ones that are going out and they're you know planning when we're going to do fundraisers. They're going to be you know soliciting donations for our, our different like bingos or things like that. Uh, and so that doesn't require you to go to fire school or anything like that. It's just you need to just be willing to put yourself out there and have conversations with the community and be willing to go to these different events and, and think outside the box for new and creative ways that we can kind of do fun drives and things of that nature. Our fire police ranks, again, are not uh, fire, uh, basically firefighting operational roles. Uh, there are some special trainings that they take to learn how to do crowd and, uh, and traffic management and things like that to keep a scene safe. But again, it's not the same kind of rigorous training that you'd go through to be an interior firefighter. Hey there, listeners. Are you in the Ocean Pines area and looking for a pharmacy that goes above and beyond? Look no further than Title Health Home Scripts. Open six days a week, our knowledgeable pharmacists are ready to fill your prescriptions in just minutes. Plus, we offer free home delivery in the Ocean Pines area and have a super convenient drive through window. Need over-the-counter items? We've got a large selection. And with our monthly sales, you'll find everything you need at great prices. Conveniently located at the north gate of Ocean Pines, Title Health Home Scripts is open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and on Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. To fill a prescription or arrange for a free home delivery, give us a call at 410-543-4769. That's 410-543-4769. Remember, that's Title Health Home Scripts, your trusted pharmacy partner. You're the one who brought it up. So you just had a, a successful fundraising thing, and that's part of what, what your volunteers do. Can you can you tell me about some of the fundraising efforts you've made? Sure. Um, so we have a couple different things. We have our, our annual fund drive that basically it's a year-round funding initiative where um, we're seeking donations year-round, but we do send out a letter, usually in the fall, targeted towards something specific. A couple years ago, it was to make sure that we could buy, as during COVID, we could buy every member a custom-fit SCBA mask. That's like the breathing mask uh, that mm -hmm. we wear. We got everyone custom masks that would specifically be designed to fit their face shape and size. Um, so one, it was more from a germ standpoint that we're keeping you know the germs away. But two, we're making sure that you now everybody has a, a mask that's sealed directly to their face to cut down the risk of cancers and smoke inhalation and things like that. In other years, we've focused on the South Station renovation project. And so that's kind of the, the yearly fund drive. Now, we also do kind of one-off events. So we recently just had a cash bingo event 
Ocean Downs Casino uh, allowed us to use their hall or their facility there. And it was a great success. Our administrative division went out. They solicited, solicited sponsors. So every game, there was a $100 winner. We also had raffle baskets and other donations. And we ended up winning over, or not winning, earning over $10,000 or fundraising $10,000, which is phenomenal. And, that, and those are funds that are going right back into the operations and the, and the apparatus replacement and things like that. Additionally, uh, we have a, we've been doing a vehicle raffle for the last couple of years this year we kind of mm. revitalized it uh, and it's a little bit different so this year uh, we're raffling off a ford f-150 2024 sxt four-wheel drive four-door and tickets are a hundred dollars and what we're doing different this year is that hundred dollars will cover all of your fees so taxes titles registration gaming fees the apartment's going to cover all of that. In years past, uh, the tickets were much cheaper. However, when the winner would win the vehicle, they'd have to pay yeah. for all those gaming fees. So last year's winner, I think, had to pay something around like $18,000 just for winning a vehicle. That'll um, teach you. Yeah, you know, and so with this, it's like, shame on you for winning. Congratulations. <laughs> um, it would, you know, it's not even like the money was coming to the department. And nope, oh, right. going right back. So this year with us adjusting the ticket price, we're going to be able to cover that as well as hopefully raise uh, more funds because as we all know, uh, the cost of everything has gone up in the fire service, the cost of fire trucks have gone up drastically. Um, we we're going to be getting a new fire truck here in the in the next couple of years. It's already on order. Um, that truck, the truck that we are buying to, uh, to is about I think like eight hundred ninety thousand dollars. The truck that it's replacing when we bought it in two thousand six two thousand seven time frame, it's like three hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's how much of a markup everything has gone in that time frame. And so for us, we're constantly trying to knock on the doors and and shake the bushes. To, to raise as much funding as we can. It's always been a particular interest of mine just covering towns and stuff like that is this idea that like my car, I have a 2000 Honda Civic and the hood doesn't shut. Fun. And that's okay, right? Because yeah. I just use it to drive back and forth to the store. I, I work from my house, but uh, fire service doesn't get that opportunity. You have hours and eventually it's like, okay, yeah, no, I know the truck works fine, but you need a new one, right? Yeah, we we actually have a set mandate from the county. We So every volunteer fire department in the county has a, a charter with the county that basically outlines what we have to do to remain a chartered volunteer fire company or fire department. Uh, and one of those stipulations is how old our frontline engine is, how old our second en- uh, piece is. So our frontline engine can be no more than 20 years old. And our second engine or our backup engine can't be any older than about 25 years old. With that in mind, you know, we're constantly having to um, raise money to make sure that we can meet those turnaround times. And it's also one of those things where it's like with anything, Back when, you know, cell phones first came out, the big thing was, okay, well, the battery is no good. We're just going to change the battery out. It's it's easy. We just pop it out, put a new battery in. Right. You know, I remember uh, multiple Samsung phones that I, you know, I would buy extra batteries off of Amazon. So that way, if we're going around, you know, a day in New York, I just pop batteries out, pop them in. No problem. Now, all of our batteries are sealed into our phones. We can't do that. And it's specific because the the manufacturers don't want you to be able to do that. They want you to buy a new phone. They don't want you to keep using the same one. Um, right. And it's the same thing with uh, with fire apparatus. Our pieces, we, we do our best to keep them in, in the best shape that we can. But there's also a lot of pieces on these fire trucks, even our newest ones from like 2006, 2010, that they're not making these pieces anymore. And so we're just kind of putting band-aids on different, different things. And so it's not because we want a new fire truck every 20 years. It's literally, it's going to be too expensive to go out and make a custom radiator to go in the truck or these custom parts and pieces um, versus kind of just transitioning through, through to the, those new pieces and to abide by that county charter. Right. It's like you've moved from planned obsolescence to planned inconvenience. <laughs> and it, it just gets to the point where like, you know what, just get another one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask you two two more quick questions. Uh, the first one is, do you recall ever being lost in Ocean Pines? Um, it's, it's kind of a, a running theme that we try to pick up on when we can, because especially, you know, earlier than than you were born, it was it was common to get lost in ocean pines because it can be so windy and so dark sometimes. So do you have any stories about being lost in ocean pines? Uh, sure. I, I remember um, right after I got my license, um, you know, like you said, windy, dark. I, I lived on the north side of the pines at that time. And um, there was more than a couple times going back into like the Bay Colony section or off like uh, Battersea. I'm glad a friend that lived down that way. It's very dark and windy and confusing down there. I remember multiple times leaving his house and turning the wrong way and be like, am I, am I going towards home? Am I going, where am I? 
<laughs> That's fantastic. And um, the the last thing that I have for you as we kind of wrap up, up again, so we have some time, but I want to give you plenty of time. Is there anything you didn't get a chance to say, something I should have asked and didn't, or something you would have asked you? Sure. So uh, there's a couple more fundraising things that we're doing that I definitely want to make sure that we hit on. Um, we just launched a new Queen of Hearts tournament that we're doing weekly. Tickets are $5. We're doing our ticket sales in person or uh, online through our website. And essentially, you pay $5, you pick a spot on the board. And if your name is drawn that week, we uncover the spot that you've selected. And if your spot that you uncovered shows the Queen of Hearts card, then you win 60% of whatever that advertised jackpot is. If there is a joker behind that spot, then you win $50. And just for having your name drawn, you win $25. So we are in week 16, I believe, of that tournament right now. Um, we do the drawings every Tuesday uh, at 5.30 p.m. We live stream them on uh, Facebook. And so uh, our hope is that we can continue to grow this tournament and that becomes another really strong fundraiser for us. There's a lot of other... So, sorry, go ahead. No, I want to interrupt you for just a second yeah. so is this a 50 a 52 week thing or so it, it's basically for as long as we are going until we find the queen of hearts once the queen of uh, hearts is found then we'll start over yeah, with, yes. with the next board that sounds like fun it, it sounds do you, do you have a lot of people tune in that seems like something people would tune in for. yeah so we we are right now it, it's a growing thing we've only been doing it um, we just started it this year in about february and so each week we're seeing more and more ticket sales come through uh it's one of those things where you know we know a lot of legions and elks lodges and things like that do a similar concept. And we actually know back when I was not in the area, I was living out near Emmitsburg and their firehouse out there does a Queen of Hearts tournament. And this time last summer, they actually had a jackpot that got up over a million dollars. Um, wow. So that means that winner won $600,000 and the fire department won $400,000. Um, we're, we're nowhere near that million dollar mark right now, but if we can continue to advertise and we can continue to get folks uh, excited about playing, we're going to just continue to grow what that jackpot is. And then everybody's going to be a winner uh, at that point. Excellent. I'm sorry. I stopped you when you were talking about the other fundraisers. Oh, you're good. You're good. We are currently working on trying to raise funds to renovate our South Station. And so we are doing a brick fundraiser where uh, folks can buy two different size bricks, $100 or $200 a brick. And then it's going to be placed in basically kind of like a memorial type of situ uh, setup around our probably our flag court um, when we finish the project. But all the proceeds from that project will go directly into the South Station renovation fund. So that way we can get that station built sooner than later. And uh, do you have a, a broad target for that or sooner than rather than later is pretty much the best we're going <laughs> to yeah, get? Yeah, sooner than later right now. We, <laughs> we, we do have some restrictions on some of the grant and bond funding that we have, um, but we're, we're hoping to make progress on it uh, in the next couple of years, if not sooner. And is is that at the end of the fundraisers? Say that again? Is that all, is that all the uh, fundraisers we're doing? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. And I don't, I don't mean that like I don't think it's enough. I mean that like I don't want to, I don't want to stop you if there's more to talk about. Oh no, no, you're good. I, I'd say the, the the only thing, other thing that I would like to say uh, is that joining the volunteer fire service was and continues to be one of the most important things that I've ever done with my life. Outside of being a husband and, and being a father, there is nothing else that I, that I have such joy and pride in doing just for the sake of knowing that I literally am making a difference. And everybody that is a part of our department makes a difference every single call, every single day. And if anyone's ever dreamt of, you know, being a volunteer, ever questioned, what, what's that noise when the fire truck goes by or wonder where they're going? Stop at the firehouse. Have a conversation with us. You know, you're it's you're never a lot of people will talk to me. Like, oh, I'm too. You're never you're never too old to get involved. There's always a spot for you at our department. Uh, and we, we have people that go through from all walks of life. You know, I talked about it before. I've had an education background. We've had firefighters. We have people that work at Duncan. We have, uh, you know, doctors, nurses. We've got room for everybody and people with different backgrounds can only make our department that much stronger as we continue to to grow you know we've been around for you know 51 years at this point and we're looking forward for another you know 51 years so uh, i really just want to encourage anybody that's listening if you ever at any point in time thought mm, maybe it'd be interesting come by have a conversation with us whether it's at the firehouse at the farmer's market the yacht club we're there uh, and uh, we 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 want to bring in good people to be a part of our team. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Great. Thank you so much. The Pines Cast is an Ocean Pines Association production. It was written and edited by me, Tony Russo. Executive producer, Josh Davis. Please subscribe where you're listening now or follow if you're on Apple. If you like the show, tell someone about it, please, because that's the best way to get the word out. 
As I mentioned at the beginning, I would love to have your feedback and I would love to keep this conversation going. If you'd care to email me, you can email me at bytonyrusso at gmail.com. That's B-Y-T-O-N-Y-R-U-S-S-O at gmail.com. And of course, we would love to have your ratings and reviews on the app of your choice. But mostly, we just want you to listen to the show. We want you to like the show. And we would like it very much if you told other people about it. You can also send along comment to the show. Tell someone about it, please, because that's the best way to get the word out. As I mentioned at the beginning, I would love to have your feedback, and I would love to keep this conversation going. If you'd care to email me, you can email me at bytonyrusso at gmail.com. That's B-Y-T-O-N-Y-R-U-S-S-O at gmail.com. And of course, we would love to have your ratings and reviews on the app of your choice. But mostly, we just want you to listen to the show We want you to like the show, and we would like it very much if you told other people about it. You can also send along comments or questions that we will address in future shows as is possible and appropriate. And that is all for this time on the Pinescast. Cast.